oxide, pentlandite, you know, there are all kinds of problems. No problem. Ni3S2 and nickel oxide. But you can imagine if there are two compounds declared as carcinogenic, it's very easy for the misinformed uh, and sometimes for the informed, if they're paid enough by lawyers or copper companies, <laughs> to, to um, make not completely truthful statements. And that causes a great deal of concern among our workers who work with all forms of nickel. And I have worked with uh, union representatives. They are very good people. They, they want the truth behind you know, what's happening in the plants. But frankly, they don't trust the company, nor properly should they trust only the company. So we bring in researchers to talk to them, to do the research. We co-sponsor research with our union, the company and the, and the union together. So when those, um, uh, that research is done, uh, epidemiology can be a very confusing subject because do our workers get lung cancer? Yes. Lung cancer is a disease of life. Do our workers get colorectal cancer? Yes. Colorectal cancer is, has a certain percentage of the Canadian population will die of colorectal cancer. Something like 6% of the Canadian population will die of lung cancer. 6%. So you have uh, people like the Workers' Safety and Insurance Board who are charged by the Ministry of Labor, the government of Ontario, and the people of, Canada, of, of Ontario to figure out whether workers are getting sick or not. If you have a worker who has um, mesothelioma, and has worked in an asbestos factory, you can be pretty well assured that the exposure in the asbestos factory caused his mesothelioma. Because mesothelioma is only caused by asbestos. Nothing else. Cigarette smoking? No, nothing else. That's a simple case. When you have a nickel worker getting, who hasn't been in in, in, with nickel sulfide or nickel oxide, they haven't been exposed to that, and they get lung cancer. Right away, it's, is it caused by nickel? Well, you have to do a, a whole case history of where did he work and what exposures, and did he smoke? Oh dear, you know, that's not a happy situation. The man has died. His widow and his children are suffering with the fact that this man has died at 63 years old. And they want some form of compensation. And here I am saying, it looks like the workplace where he worked, his exposures were to nickel forms that do not cause cancer. He smoked two packs of cigarettes a day for 25 years, it's more likely that the smoking cause, that's not what people want to hear. And I know it's not what they want to hear, but it's, it's, it's a, a very difficult social problem. Uh, and um, the WSIB has sometimes put in place policies regarding nickel that are ill-advised. And um, when we fight the WSIB, oftentimes our, our workers and the union feel we are fighting them. But I'm not particularly, I'm trying to bring the best science for a fair assessment of what's going on. And I know that everybody wants fairness, but when people are emotionally being, being hurt, it's very difficult for them to accept it. 
So in our own workforce, yes, we have issues with epidemiology and, and nickel and all kinds of other exposures, diesel exhaust exposure, or, you know, oil mist exposure, what have you. And so we as a company and, and the people who have taken my job, uh, when I had my vice president's job, my job was to try to sort out all the information that we knew about all the exposures and what the probability was that this worker was exposed and, mm -hmm. and that was the cause of his disease. Very complicated. And it's something that we, we still struggle with. You, uh, it must have been a very interesting job, but also a very difficult one. It was yeah, very it was challenging and at times, at times. Uh, stressful, yeah. uh, especially when you're when you're trying to talk to uh, people about science who don't understand science, and that's where you know a lot of regulators in Europe or or what they said to me is, "Look, Dr. Conard, you don't understand. We want simple regulations." You're making things more complicated. I said, well, I'm, I'm sorry, but nature is sometimes complicated. It's not cut and dry, black and white. What is causing what? Because there are all kinds of factors at work here. Oh, that's too complicated. You know, we're just going to put in a regulation that nickel, you know, is, well, you know, th that's going to hurt nickel producers, and it's going to hurt the stockholders of companies like Engel because they're going to be paying possibly unfair compensation for diseases that the company didn't cause. Well, it's considered a social, you know, service. And you know, uh, sometimes we 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 find that we have to uh, appeal a a ruling or we have to fight something. Uh, it's a very difficult, especially when people you know, are, are, it's not that they're, they're not dying. They, they, somebody has died, but you, you're trying to ascertain what was the cause of the death. So medicine, medical people become involved. And I have to, you know, speak their language, or I had to speak their language as well. So it's, it's a very challenging, mm -hmm. very rewarding in a sense. I learned an awful lot. I bet. Um, we'll just finish you. I'd mentioned you're retired now, but you consult. Uh, on, on epidemiology. Okay, I was going to ask what, uh, yes. what do you do right now? We've done a, a new study, an update of our workforce, and the papers are just now being written by uh, a Laurentian University primary investigator, and uh, I'm an author of, of the paper. Of the paper. Um, papers, it turns out there are three of them. Um, the union is, uh, I consider to be a partner in, in, in this uh, work. Um, and we have to continue to follow up some um, Some uncertain th things that we're not certain about, uh, we have to do a different kind of study than a normal epidemiology study. And that involves more money and more time and so forth. And uh, it's not up to me whether the company is and going to do so that. Inco? Well, Valet? Or? Valet, it's up yeah. to Valet Canada. And um, well, first, we have to decide exactly what the study design will answer the question in the most effective way. And that's oftentimes not, not easy to do, to design the study. Um, I'm also involved in studying diesel exhaust uh, emissions and reducing them. I started that when I was vice president. I'm continuing. We have found um, a, uh, a high temperature filter that uh, filters out enormous amount of dust, and uh, the the workers like it. It's uh, after 12 years of research, it's now uh, foolproof. It means it doesn't have human beings 
associated with making decisions. It's done automatically by measurements of the engine, whether or not uh, the, the filter should be uh, regenerated or cleaned or, or whatever. So we are in the process of recommending that all the mines, the new engines being put into Valet Canada's mines have this filter on them, whether light duty vehicles or heavy duty vehicles. And it's, it's taken 12 years of research to do that and a lot of failures in, uh, we didn't invent technologies, we are using technologies that were um, in the process of being developed and we were trying to. One of the things about underground mining is that when you put a piece of equipment on a diesel engine, it has to be rugged, it has to be able to put up with uh, uh, service in, in uh, oftentimes uh, uh, very demanding physical and, and, and dusty environments. And that's what we found, is, is that we have found the filter to do that. And now the thing is to implement it. So that's, I continue to help the, uh, we continue to monitor a certain number of vehicles underground with the filters on them, uh, just to make sure that we know everything about them. I'm involved in that. I think that's all the time you have, eh? I probably missed my train, so oh, yeah? go ahead and ask some <laughs> other questions. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> There's another one? Yes. Okay. Um, well, we can, we'll finish off with a few questions. Um, one that might be tough um, to answer just because it, it might be broad, but uh, if you could pick a proudest um, moment or accomplishment uh, in your life, let's go professionally. Mm in your professional life, uh, what would it be? If there's a, a few, that's fine as well. Well, I think something like um, being awarded uh, a CIM, CIM fellowship, being awarded a CIM silver medal for my uh, career accomplishments, that really meant a lot because it's your fellow um, scientists and, and people who nominate you and have to um, write things to, to convince the, the Metallurgical Board or the CIM to honor this particular person. So it means a lot to me to have my fellow um, CIM people recognize that I, I've done something. Mm -hmm. And um, if you were to speak to someone much younger, like a student, for example, um, what would be uh, the one big piece of advice or life lesson you could give them when it comes to their future, their profession? Or Study. Spend a lot of time getting your facts organized and, and right, but be humble. You don't know everything. You know very little, really. You specialize in a, in a, in a bit. And the best thing that a person with a lot of information can do is listen to other people and then share with them things that you know, but you have to listen to them as well as them listening to you. Mm -hmm. And I think oftentimes that message is not learned effectively within our educational system because the higher and higher you get, the more convinced that you, you know a great deal. And I've seen enormous number of cases where very smart people can't deliver a message because they haven't listened and they haven't, haven't entered a two-way 
uh, discourse. It's all sort of like I've got this to to tell you. So it's it's uh, advice to young people is as be humble and listen, but be prepared to deliver your message in a correct fashion. Have you ever dealt with um, students or? Yes, I've given enormous number of talks in Queens, Toronto, Waterloo, McMaster, um, Laurentian. Mostly um, on uh, safety and? Uh, no, no, and no. on, on uh, uh, thermodynamics and, okay. and, and other. But m I guess most recently in the, in the past 20 years, yes, it's on, uh, it's on environmental issues. But before that, it was on uh, research that we were doing. And I've given enormous number of papers at the CIM conference, like the one that's here this week. Um, it, it's very important to engage with um, your colleagues outside you know, your little environment. Um, it's, it's the potential for collaboration um, and real, real friendships being formed. It's very valuable. Mm -hmm. Have you joined any other organizations or committees? Well, I was with the, 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 the uh, TM, uh, TMS uh, of the American Institute of Mining Engineers uh, for many years and went to an enormous number of conferences down there. The, the CIM and the TMS uh, uh, tend to cooperate a great deal. Um, and then I would give talks in, you know, be invited to Australia or Japan or, or whatever and, and give talks there. So um, I've been very fortunate in uh, the amount of interaction I was able to have outside just in Colon. Yeah. And uh, we forgot to get back to it, but uh, were, did you still work when INCO was taken over by that? No, no I, was, I was then retired. Okay. I retired in 2004, and I think the takeover is 2005. What I was involved in was um, Valet in Brazil sent up a number of representatives in the, in the year or two years before they purchased the company to do due diligence investigating just what the company was, you know, perhaps hiding in that closet over there. And the valet people were very concerned about this class action suit in Port Colburn. And so they wanted to know scientifically what was our defense, you know, what, what how, how. And um, so I talked with them at, at great lengths about uh, the, the challenges the company faced in regulatory activity or legal activity um, as a result of, of misinformation about uh, the toxicology of nickel compounds. And uh, around what time was it uh, you had mentioned with the, um, after the lawsuit, uh, the technology with the plants? That was being developed at the same time as the okay, lawsuit. Yeah. Yeah, okay. it was a a, a a dream I had, um, and when I mentioned it to the ministry, the ministry became, you know, obviously very interested in it. But they needed, as as anybody would, a demonstration that it was going to be effective, and um, that's what we were involved in when. Um, uh, we had plans for a demonstration, a large demonstration in Port Colburn, and it, it was axed because of financial concerns. And uh, you know there was a downturn in the market in 2008, kind of thing. And the recession, you know, sort of hit, and, and uh, money was tight. Yeah. And uh, that kind of of research was canceled. And uh, it will probably happen at some point, but I don't know whether I'll be alive to see it. Is there a future for it in, uh, let's say there was approval and money, uh, is there um, a future for it in Canada? 
in terms of iron rich soil? Iron rich uh, or nickel? Sorry, nickel rich. Yes. In fact, we tested it in our tailings area because okay. uh, in the tailings area in Sudbury, um, we, we the mill puts out you know um, uh, all of the what I was most interested in, in a mineral called pyrotite. It's very prevalent in the ore that Inco brings up. It's essentially an iron sulfide. But it's a non-stoichiometric iron sulfide. And a lot of the places where iron normally sits, nickel replaces it. So there is a, uh, there's a certain amount of nickel in pyrotite, maybe about, um, in, in pure pyrotite, maybe about 0.8%, uh, something like that. Uh, but uh, I may be wrong on it, just a minute. Maybe more like 0.5%. But they dump the pyrotite to a special area because the company was saying, at some point, we may want to invent the process to go back and get that point five to point eight percent nickel, which is throwaway right now, but 25 years from now, who knows? Mm -hmm. uh, it may be a better source than our, our underground operations. So we put it in a particular area so we can go back and get it. I was interested in can we get some of that right now? Of course, the area is very deep and you can only, the plant roots only get about you know, if you, if you cultivate maybe eight inches where the plow, you know, disturbs you the soil. the soil? Yeah. yeah. And before you plant. And the roots grow down to, you know, may, maybe eight inches. But then you can rotate the soil. And that involves quite a bit of land movement. But if it works, it, it pays for you because of the amount of nickel Still that you can get out. Than mining, yeah. So we tested the the um, one of the questions was, do these plants alyssum, which initially were formed in lateritic areas, which are close to the equator, so will these plants perform well in? in <laughs> will they regrow, or do do they need to be planted every year? And um, that was one question. Or can we be clever enough that we can breed a certain high surviving plant that doesn't maybe collect as much nickel with a plant that is a lower survival but collects a lot of nickel and can you get a... Make it into uh, a perennial. Yeah, yeah. It, it, into a plant that will survive the, the uh, Canadian Usher. winter. <laughs> and uh, the, the uh, before I retired, I will say the results were promising. I can't say completely successful, but promising enough that had I been in the position for a number of other more years, I would have devoted some more money and time to have people um, develop that further. Mm -hmm. So it's, in my mind, it's not out of the question. Well, it's pretty innovative. Um, are there any um, last things you'd like to say? Anything you'd like to add? No, I, I'm, I'm sorry if I rambled a, a, a great deal. I get passionate about these no, things. No, yeah, no, I can tell. It's very uh, interesting. So sometimes my wife tells me, you know, <laughs> you, you've got to let somebody else speak for a little bit. So I'm, I'm sorry about that. But I, no, no, I, am, here. I am passionate about uh, research. I'm, I'm passionate about what the metallurgical community has done in Canada in terms of research at Naranda, at Kaminko, you know, the, the, the uh, clever, clever people and the, the uh, strides forward and the, the invention of, of new uses for, for metals. And um, I, I will say though that the, the, new, the new challenges are Primarily environmental, I think. 
And uh, I think we all have to be concerned about the changes our society will have to have to combat global warming. And I know change is oftentimes, you know, it's, you, you can't fight it, but sometimes it's very difficult to live through. And uh, we just need young people, very clever people, dedicated people to make the right decisions in those areas. So I wish them well. Thank you. Welcome. Appreciate it.